It was an unusual general conference. The weather had turned cold, with a steady rain falling. On Wednesday, the rain turned to snow, wrapping Temple Square in a veil of white. It was the first general conference in a year, a flu epidemic having canceled October conference the year before. And now, a record crowd braved the last snowfall of the season to be in the tabernacle with their leaders. On Sunday afternoon, a new leader was sustained. A 48-year-old stake president from East Mill Creek was named an assistant to the 12. His name was Gordon B. Hinckley. I'm reminded of a statement made by my first missionary companion when I received a letter of transfer to the European Mission Office. After I'd read it, I turned it over to him, and he read it. And he said, well, you must have helped an old lady across the street in the pre-existence. It isn't anything you've done here. <laughs> Humbly, I seek the blessing of the Lord. I am overwhelmed with a sense of inadequacy. I feel shaken. I'd like to express my appreciation to my father, who lies very critically ill in the hospital. No son ever had a better father. I'd like to express appreciation to my mother. I say these things because I'd like to make the point that all of us in our various situations are the result largely of the lives that touch ours. And today I feel profoundly grateful for all who have touched mine. President's Office, Great Salt Lake City, April 12, 1867. Elder Ira Hinckley. Dear brother, we wish to get a good and suitable person to settle on and take charge of the church ranch at Cove Creek, Millard County. Your name has been suggested for this position. As it is some distance from any other settlement, a man of sound practical judgment and experience is needed to fill the place. If you think you can take this mission, you should endeavor to go a week from next Monday. Your brother in the gospel, Brigham Young. In 1867, Ira Nathaniel Hinckley left his home and built this fort on a lonely prairie in southern Utah. Unlike most of frontier America's wooden forts, which are now largely gone, Ira Hinckley built his coal fort of volcanic rock laid in lime mortar. The walls at the base were four feet thick. After 125 years, it still stands. Dad feels very strongly about his ancestors. Ira Hinckley, of course, and who was his grandfather, Brian S. Hinckley, his father. His maternal grandparents, the Bittners, are very much a part of him and a part of his life. Uh, feels a great debt of gratitude all of them. He's solid. There's nothing small about him. He's been firm in the faith all his days. He takes after his father and his grandfather who were likewise solid. In a way, he's a lot like Cole Ford. At the dawn of the 20th century, America was very different from the nation it would soon become. In 1900, there were only 45 states in the Union. The total U.S. population was 76 million, barely two-fifths of what it would be six decades later. The average American worker earned 22 cents an hour. Automobiles were beginning to appear, but the truck and bus were yet to be invented. In any case, less than 150 miles of paved highway existed in the whole United States. 
It was a different, simpler America than it would be only 10 years later. But most could feel that change was coming. In 1900, a young educator, Bryant S. Hinckley, was teaching classes in business at Brigham Young Academy in Provo when change came into his life, a call from the leadership of the church. He was to take over the fledgling Salt Lake Business College as its new principal and make it a success. The family moved to Salt Lake City, but shortly thereafter, his wife died, leaving him with a small family to raise. Bryant carried on. Within time, he became acquainted with a lovely and competent teacher on his staff. Ada Bittner had just returned from Chicago, where she had been trained in the new Greg shorthand. She was now the first in the state to be teaching the method. Bryant and Ada's friendship grew, and in the summer of 1909, they were married in the Salt Lake Temple. On June 23, 1910, their first child, a son, was born. They named him Gordon Bittner. With the birth of their child, Ada gave up a career at the business college, and in this two-story home on the corner of 840 East and 7th South, Gordon was raised in an environment of love and learning. Dad's parents were highly educated people. They loved to learn. They were both professional teachers and gifted teachers. And so books and uh, information was just something that was the atmosphere of their home. He remembers there was one room called the library. It had a solid table, a good lamp, a couple of comfortable chairs with good lighting, and the walls were lined with books. And there were over a thousand volumes, ones that his parents had acquired over the years. He's told us what a quiet place it was, that it was a place for study. There were books about history, literature, books on technical subjects, atlases, encyclopedias, a good dictionary. Now, I don't think as a boy, Dad spent all of his time reading, but he was exposed to great literature. There was this love for good books and a love for learning in that home. When Gordon and I were young, <clears throat> our folks bought a place out in the country. It was a farm, and we lived there during the summer. Gordon and I often slept out, and lying on our back, we could see the stars. They were a great sight. We could trace the Big Dipper, and from it, we could find the North Star. Dad has often talked about his youth on the farm, and uh, particularly his sleeping out at nights with his brother, and watching the North Star as they fell asleep and would wake up during the night, and noticing that that star never moved. And uh, you could tell that even in those early years, he was starting to form impressions and feelings about that quality of steadiness and of immovability and of dependability. Those have been great traits of his, and I think he's appreciated them very much in others. In 1922, Bryant Hinckley was serving in the presidency of Liberty Stake, the largest stake in the church, with a membership of over 15,000. One evening, shortly after Gordon was ordained a deacon, his father took him to a stake priesthood meeting at the old 10th Ward. It was here that an unusual event occurred that would remain with him the rest of his life. My father went to the stand and I sat on the back row. The meeting was called to order and the opening song was praise to the man who communed with Jehovah. All of the men stood to sing. The hall was filled with men, many who had come as converts from Europe and they lifted their voices in unison in that great hymn, Praise to the man who communed with Jehovah. Jesus anointed that prophet and seer. Blessed to open the last dispensation, kings shall extol him and nations revere. It touched my heart. It gave me a feeling that was difficult to describe. I'd never had it previously in terms of any church experience. There came into my heart a conviction that 
The man of whom they sang was really a prophet of God. And I'm grateful to be able to say that that conviction which came, I believe, by the power of the Holy Spirit has never left me. Graduating from LDS High School in 1928, Gordon enrolled that fall at the University of Utah. He set his sights on a career in journalism, and over the next four years, he would take every writing course available to him. At nights, he worked at the Deseret Gym, attending the key room. During the summer, he took care of the gym's plumbing, maintenance, and electrical work. I learned to use tools, he recalled, and I have loved them ever since. Dad could fix anything. If there was something to be done, he simply figured out a way to do it. And if that meant fix the toaster, he fixed the toaster. A classic example of that is when they moved into the little home when they were very first married. That was a little summer home that belonged to his parents. It didn't have a furnace in it. Now, unlike some people who would have said, we can't move there because there's no heat, he just said, we'll get a furnace. And he ordered a furnace read the instructions, and installed the furnace. And that's the way he did everything. I remember going to a friend's home one day, and they were talking about their toaster that they needed to pick up from the repairman. And I couldn't believe it. I had no idea there were people who even fixed toasters. <laughs> I thought every father did this. Gordon not only had a gift with tools, but by the time he reached college, he was gaining a reputation as a public speaker. One day, it was announced that Apostle and U.S. Senator Reed Smoot would give an address at Gordon's own first ward. But something at the last minute prevented Elder Smoot from coming. Thinking quickly, Bishop John Duncan called in two young men from his ward, Robert Sontag and Gordon Hinckley, and assigned them to substitute for Senator Smoot that evening. Gordon had a watering turn to handle at the family farm. He handled it changed his clothes and was on the stand before an overflow congregation who had come to hear Senator Smoot. His speaking companion, Bob Sontag, recalled, when Gordy Hinckley finished speaking, people had forgotten all about Senator Smoot. The boy really stirred them. Life was full and happy for the Hinckleys. Then in 1930, while Gordon's mother was traveling in Europe, she began to feel an unusual pain. Upon returning, the doctors gave a grim diagnosis, cancer. Six months later, she was gone. I recall the gray November day of her funeral, Gordon said. We put on a front of bravery and fought back the tears. But inside, the wounds were deep and painful. From that day, he would carry a deepened understanding for all who lose a loved one in death. The little family tried to return to normal living. Gordon threw himself into his university studies and in 1932 he graduated with a degree in English and a minor in ancient languages. The class of 1932 entered a world struggling in the depths of the Great Depression. Nearly half the nation's banks had failed. Unemployment was over 30%. It was a time of soup lines and suicides. Only those who lived through it would ever really understand the depth of the economic catastrophe that hit the nation and spread across the world. It was a time of terrible discouragement and it was felt strongly on the campus of the university. And I'm frank to say that I felt some of that myself. I began to question some things, including perhaps in a slight measure the faith of my parents and some of those things. That isn't unusual for university students, but the atmosphere was particularly acute at that time. But I'm grateful to say that with all of that, the testimony which had come to me as a boy remained with me and became as a bulwark to which I could cling through those very difficult years. Gordon continued to work at the gym as he carefully saved his money. He had a goal, 
to enroll the following year at Columbia University and earn a graduate degree in journalism. Then, on a Sunday afternoon, Bishop Duncan called him into his office. A mission was discussed. Gordon was shocked. Very few missionaries were being called because of the Depression. But he responded affirmatively. When the call came from church headquarters, it was to the European mission with headquarters in London. Because of an unfavorable exchange rate in Britain, it was the costliest mission in the world. Meanwhile, the bank in which Gordon had been keeping his money failed, taking with it his entire savings. And at that time, the bishop spoke to my father, presumably, and my father said, yes, we'll do all we can to see that your needs are met. And he did so, and my brother, who was working, augmented that with some of his own resources. And a little more was needed, and we discovered that my mother had established a little savings account from the coins she received in change when she bought groceries and did other shopping, and that filled whatever gap there was. And I always considered that money, which she had saved so meticulously, as sacred and so regarded it. On June 20th, 1933, Gordon Hinckley left Salt Lake City for New York. After a three-day rail journey, he arrived in New York City. Then he boarded the SS Manhattan, bound for England. After arriving at the mission home in London, Gordon was assigned to Preston, 200 miles to the north in Lancashire. I felt very lonely on the train ride to Preston, he recalled. His companion, Kent Bramwell, met him at the station and took him to their living quarters. He then announced that they would go into town and hold a street meeting. I was terrified. I stepped on that, up on that little stand and looked at that crowd of people who'd gathered. They were dreadfully poor at that time in the bottom of the Depression. They looked rather menacing and mean. But I somehow stumbled through whatever I had to say. When I arrived there, I was not well. I felt I wasn't getting anywhere in the missionary work, and I became discouraged. I wrote a letter to my father and said, I'm wasting my time and your money. I don't see any point in my staying here. And in due time, a letter came back from him in which he simply said, Dear Gordon, I have your letter of such and such a date. I have only one suggestion. Forget yourself and go to work. Love with love your father. I pondered that and the next morning in our scripture class, we read that great statement of the Lord. He that saveth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake and the gospel shall find it. It touched me. That statement, that promise, in conjunction with my father's letter, prompted me to go upstairs in the little bedroom at 15 Wadham Road, Preston, Lancashire, where we lived, and get on my knees and make a covenant with the Lord that I would try to forget myself and go to work. I count that as the day of decision in my life. Everything good that's happened to me since then, I can trace back to the decision I made at that time. After five months in Lancashire, Elder Hinckley was transferred to the European Mission Office in London, where he worked as assistant to Elder Joseph F. Merrill of the Council of the Twelve, who presided over the missions in Europe. It was a time of broadened opportunities for the young missionary, who more than ever tried to lose himself in the work of the Lord. Elder Hinckley and I and uh, some of the other missionaries in London would take our portable stand and uh, set it up there in Hyde Park, which uh, at the time was a very well-known forum for uh, public speaking. But uh, there were hecklers there and they were ready to interrupt you and uh, question you. We learned to speak quickly on our feet and respond to them 
and it was a growing experience to learn how to defend the church and speak up for the church in view of uh, hecklers that wanted to embarrass you. One day in 1935, President Merrill was surprised to open several of London's leading newspapers and find a review of a fictitious anti-Mormon book which purported to be a history of the Mormons. President Merrill called for his young assistant. I want you to go down to the book publisher and protest this, he said. My inclination was to say, why me, President? Why don't you go? You're an older man and I'm just a boy. I didn't say it. I said, yes, sir. I went up in our little room and got on my knees and asked for the blessing of the Lord. I arrived at the office of the publisher and entered and handed my card to the receptionist and told her that I would like to see the president of the company. And she said, Mr. Skeffington is very busy. And I said, well, I've come about 5,000 miles and I'll wait for him. So I sat there and she went in and out of his office two or three times. And I guess finally she concluded that I would wait there. And she went in again and came out and said, he'll see you. Well, I'll never forget the picture. I walked in, he was seated behind a big desk, had a cigar out of the corner of his mouth and seemed to be saying, what do you want, kid? But he was gracious. He said, what is your problem? And I began to explain to him. I don't know what I said after that. At first, he was rather belligerent in his response, but he softened. And he said, finally, I'll recall all those books and tip in a page on which we will say that this book is fiction and is not in any sense to be construed as history. He did that. It was a tremendous thing. He sent me a Christmas card each year after that, I think for as long as he lived. It was a tremendous lesson to me. I came to know that if we would put our faith in the Lord and go forward in trust, that he would open the way. I've never forgotten it. It left, that experience left a mark upon my life. In June of 1935, Elder Hinckley's mission began drawing to a close he would leave England a different young man than when he came. He had come to know the beauty and culture of Britain and had grown to love its people. More importantly, the doubts and questions of his college days had been replaced by a firm testimony. I came to know my father in heaven and my savior, he said, to a degree unrealized before. Returning to New York, he took a bus to 116th Street and stepped through the gates at Columbia University. Thoughtfully, Gordon walked across campus just to see what I had missed, he recalled. He traveled by rail to Detroit, where according to arrangement, he picked up a new car for his father, a 1935 Plymouth for $740. Then he and a friend from his mission, G. Homer Durham, drove the 1,600 miles to Salt Lake. Gordon recalls, I arrived home worn out, weighing 126 pounds, and said that I had no desire ever to travel again. His mission president had asked him to meet with the First Presidency and report on needs and conditions in the missions of Europe. On the appointed morning, he went to the administration building and met with President Heber J. Grant and his counselors, J. Reuben Clark and David O. McKay. President Grant told me that I could take 15 minutes, he recalled. Then they began to ask questions, and I was there for over an hour. Several days later, President McKay called and offered Gordon a position with the church. He was asked to serve as producer and secretary of the newly organized Radio Publicity and Mission Literature Committee. The committee was comprised of six members of the Twelve, with Elder Stephen L. Richards as chairman. There was an empty office available, but no furniture. He went downstairs and asked for a ream of paper. A whole ream, he was asked. Did he know how many pages were in the ream? He did. Next, 
He went to a former missionary companion whose father dealt in office furniture and came away with a reject table. One leg was short. He fixed that with a block of wood. The top was warped and split. He would ignore that. He brought his typewriter from home, set up shop, and went to work. From this office would come hundreds of scripts for radio, film strips, and motion pictures, and the pioneering of the use of media in the church. We lived in a very large ward of more than 1,500 people. Among the girls who lived in that ward was one named Marjorie Pay. I saw her first when she was in primary and gave a reading. And I don't know what it did to me, but I never forgot it. And she grew older into a beautiful young woman, and we continued our association. And after a long time, we were married. When I first met him, I thought he was a very unusual man. He was different. Everything he did, he did with a little flair that was typical of him and no one else. He was a lot of fun, but he had wonderful integrity. He never had to worry about what he said or what he did. Marge and I were married April 29th, 1937, in the Salt Lake Temple. Stephen L. Richards of the Council of the Twelve officiated at our ceiling. It was a very impressive ceremony. We moved to the little summer home which my father had, and we fixed it up, put a furnace in, some insulation, made it tight and comfortable, and there we lived for the first two or three years of our marriage. Prior to his marriage, Gordon had served on the Liberty Stake Sunday School Board, and then as Stake Sunday School Superintendent. Now, a new call came, to serve as a member of the Sunday School General Board. Gordon was 27 years old. During his nine years on the board, he would travel to wards and stakes and author a course of study on the Book of Mormon, which would be used in Sunday schools throughout the world for the next 25 years. What? What is this? The voice of God. The earth trembles. Yes, I felt it. Look, the tower is falling. The Tower of Babel! It topples on our heads! Run! Run for your life! The Radio Publicity and Mission Literature Committee pioneered the use of media in spreading the gospel and in telling the story of the church. I think we did some highly significant things in those days. Among these was the Fullness of Time series of 39 half-hour radio dramatizations of the history of the church. I had the responsibility for the production of that series. I wrote most of the scripts and we produced them in Hollywood. They ran on hundreds of radio stations across the nation. They gave tremendous exposure to the church. In 1939, when the World's Fair was held on Treasure Island in San Francisco, we constructed a model of the Salt Lake Tabernacle. It would seat approximately 50 people. We installed a fine small organ, secured a missionary who was an expert organist, and presented organ recitals there. And it was a wonderful place where people tired of walking would come in and sit down and enjoy themselves. It was a very significant thing and out of it came some substantial results. That was indicative of the kind of work that we did. President Hinckley has always had a great interest in the use of the media to preach the gospel. He organized the first uh, use of the media by the church years ago. He has retained that interest and it's amazing to witness his quick insight and panoramic view of any media situation. And the church's broadcasting today has been greatly influenced by this great man. In the meantime, the Hinckley's first child, Kathleen, was born, and Gordon began digging footings for a new home he would build on their property in East Mill Creek. By the time their second child, Richard, was born in 1941, the new home was ready for occupancy. Dad, of course, designed this home, and with the help of friends, built it. It was a, a great place for kids to grow up. 
a lot of open space and a lot of things to do fields and gullies and trees and huts and paths and hidden places and we also gorged ourselves on fresh cherries and peaches and apples green and apples gr always green apples they were the best it was a great place to grow up and as far as we were concerned we wanted to stay here forever On December 7, 1941, the world changed dramatically as America was drawn into the vortex of World War II. The calling of full-time missionaries ground to a halt, and Gordon Hinckley began thinking how he might best serve his country. Shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, he went to a Navy recruiting office and applied for officer training, but was rejected because of a history of allergies and asthma. Still wanting to assist with the war effort, he obtained a job as assistant superintendent of the Salt Lake City Union Depot and Railroad Company. As station master, he supervised a large flow of rail traffic through Salt Lake City. The railroad company liked what they saw in this young and energetic employee. And after several months, he was brought to the head office in Denver, where he was made assistant manager of mail, baggage, and express traffic for the entire system. The young family moved to Denver, where their third child, Virginia, was born, and Gordon appeared to be on a career path that could have drastically altered the course of his life. Then, one day after the war, Gordon stopped at the church offices and called on his friend and mentor, Stephen L. Richards. President Richards asked him to return to church employment. His help was needed in the newly reopened missionary work, it was difficult for me to resign from the railroad, Gordon said. They had treated me very well. Railroad officials asked him to take a 90-day leave and return if he wished. But after several weeks, he had made his decision. This is the Lord's work, he told a friend. And I feel I would make my best contribution in life by doing my humble part to further the cause. The family moved back to Salt Lake and returned to the home in East Mill Creek. Shortly thereafter, Gordon was called as second counselor in the East Mill Creek Stake Presidency. A year later, he was made first counselor. They were wonderful years when the children were small. Clark was born in 1947. And Jane, our fifth and last child, joined us in 1954. We didn't have a lot of money, so we just did things that were fun, not expensive. And we saw the state of Utah, every square foot of it. Mother would read to us on vacations. And she always had two or three good books that she brought. And instead of listening to the radio or tapes like we do now, Mother would read. I re vividly remember one summer we read Where the Red Friend Grows. It, we all cried together, and at the end I remember we had to go around the blocks, block a few times when we arrived somewhere to dry our tears before we could be seen in public. We always stopped at every single historical marker that was ever placed by the side of a highway. But he knew his history, and it just came alive for us. He could tell us everything about it. It was fun. In 1951, Gordon was called by the First Presidency to serve as Executive Secretary to the General Missionary Committee. In this capacity, he would manage the day-to-day -day operation of the missionary program for the next seven years. And the office was the man in those days. So the calls would come in any time, day or night, so that it was a 24-hour-a-day responsibility. I remember coming in the office one morning. When I arrived, the phone was ringing. And before I took off my hat, I had talked with a mission president from South America, with another from Europe, and with another from Asia. The phone would ring night and day, at the office and at home. But we were blessed by the Lord. In 1953, President McKay called me to his office. He told me that the church was building a new temple in Switzerland, near Bern that it would be a somewhat different kind of temple. He asked me to find a way to present the temple ceremony 
in such fashion that it can be given in all of the languages of Europe with a minimum number of people participating. And we accepted that challenge. I gathered about me some very capable people and we went to work. It was a challenge. We moved in a direction and quite different from anything that had been tried before. I'm grateful to say that out of that pioneering effort has come the method by which the temple ceremony is presented in all but two of the 47 temples now in action. It was still early in the morning on Sunday, October 28, 1956, but members of the East Mill Creek Stake had already begun to fill the seats of the Granite Stake Tabernacle for stake conference. Elders Harold B. Lee and George Q. Morris were presiding, and the large stake was to be divided. When Elder Lee presented the name of Gordon B. Hinckley as president of the East Mill Creek Stake, a murmur of approval swept through the congregation. He uh, was dearly loved by all of the people, and I think most of the members of the stake recognized his great ability as a leader and an administrator. And so the, the feeling was uh, unanimous and, uh, and almost anxious to sustain him as their new stake leader. When Dad was called a stake president, there was only one building in the stake boundaries. And so there was a tremendous need to build a new stake center and some new buildings. And in my memory, one of his first official acts as stake president was to cancel our stake lagoon day and to invite all the members of the stake to take whatever money they would have spent at lagoon and put it into the new stake building fund. Uh, he just had a way of getting at things very quickly and, and uh, taking care of the most important things first. Well, I think the people loved him because he was a doer he had a way of uh, making you feel good, and the meetings were never a drag. And I don't think I ever dreaded having to get up early Sunday morning and go to a meeting because I knew there was going to be some good activity and a lot of inspiration and a lot of humor and fun at the meetings. I think maybe one of Dad's least known attributes publicly is his sense of humor. Uh, in the years that we were growing up, even when he was the stake president and he was very involved as executive secretary of the missionary committee and he was working on the opening of new temples, uh, we never got, uh, as a family, I don't think, any sense that there was a great deal of pressure uh, on him even at that point. Uh, and part of that was that he just had a good sense of humor. He has a great ability to laugh. Uh, that was another aspect, I think, of our, our dinners together as a family is that there was a lot of laughing that took place. And I can remember him coming home from the office and, and repeating to us a joke that he'd heard and laughing so hard he couldn't tell it. He just got red in the face and couldn't breathe. And he still does that. Well, his sense of humor got us through all the crises in our lives. <laughs> because he never took himself too seriously or anything else too seriously, except things that should be taken seriously, of course. But he was not a worrier. Humor is a very important element in life wonderful to be able to laugh, to laugh at ourselves, particularly, not to have fun at the expense of others, but to see the bright side of things. There's a little streak of humor in almost every situation, and uh, it's the thing that gives sparkle and makes life tolerable, really. What a great thing is a little humor. I remember the Saturday of April Conference, 1958, uh, very well. The phone rang, I answered it, it was President McKay on the phone. I recognized his voice, he did not identify himself. And I ran out in the yard where Dad was working and got him and followed him in and watched his reaction. He said, in essence, uh, yes sir, I'll be right there. And silently went uh, immediately to his room, showered, changed his clothes and was gone. And the next time I recall seeing him was on the stand at General Conference the next day when he was sustained as the General Authority and assistant to the Twelve. Since President McKay spoke with me late last evening, I have been wondering a 
about the road that led here. I know that I have not come that road alone. And I feel very grateful for the many men and women who have helped me. I was in my early teens when Dad was called to be an assistant to the 12. When you're in that stage of your life, your parents don't look perfect. In fact, they look less than perfect, and I was quite aware of any human foibles, foibles that my parents uh, displayed. And so it, the call came as a little faith crisis for me. <laughs> I thought, how could the Lord call somebody like my dad, who's so average and sometimes lacking? <laughs> and after the dinner table that afternoon when we were getting over the shock uh, of the call, I said, well, I guess the Lord is just going to have to work with what he's got. And, and everyone laughed, but to me that's an expression of, of my faith. I really believed that the Lord would turn him into something more than my father. And he has. One of Elder Hinckley's first assignments was to work with President Henry D. Moyle in dividing the missions of the world into areas under the direction of the Twelve. Although at the time he was an assistant to the Twelve, Elder Hinckley was given responsibility for the work in Asia. Over the next eight years, he would travel to the Orient 21 times. The church was small and weak in that part of the world. We had no buildings, we met in small rented homes, but it's been my great and satisfying experience to see the miracle of what's happened in Asia. And out of that number have come strong leaders, men and women who through all of these years have kept the faith and grown in their capacity and filled great responsibilities in that wonderful part of the earth, an area which I greatly love. President Gordon B. Hinckley is without question the father of the church in Asia. I can still see President Hinckley uh, situated in some dark, unheated, partially unlighted meeting hall where people were crouched uh, in discomfort sometimes with a wonderful peaceful, happy look on his face, uh, expressing courage, expressing love, expressing faith, inspiring the people to think that this was paradise if they could have the Spirit of the Lord in their lives. I've tramped over that part of the earth a great deal, worked with the missionaries, and loved the people, and they will always have. I love them. I'm so grateful for the people of this church. I thank the Lord every morning for the faithful people of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Three and a half years after his call as an assistant to the Twelve, another change, perhaps the most significant, came into Elder Hinckley's life. It was early Saturday morning on the last day of September 1961 when Marjorie answered the telephone. It was President David O. McKay. Forty-five minutes later, President McKay invited Elder Hinckley to be seated in his office. He spoke of my grandfather, who came from Nauvoo to this valley, who responded to a call from Brigham Young to go down and build Cove Fort. He spoke of my good father, for whom President McKay had great affection. And then he indicated to me that he wished to extend a call for me to serve as a member of the Council of the Twelve Apostles. I was overwhelmed by that statement and that call. I hope I have kept the trust that was imposed in me by that sacred call from the President of the Church. 
When this call to the 12 came, we knew that he felt very humbled by it, but we knew that he could do a wonderful work for the Lord, and he did. He was blessed. Shortly after his call, Elder Hinckley joined President Henry D. Moyle in Europe, where they visited its 21 missions in 23 days, holding day-long seminars in each. He continued to supervise the work in Asia, dedicating Thailand and South Vietnam for the preaching of the gospel. He traversed war-torn Vietnam several times during the war, strengthening local members and servicemen. In 1967, he was given responsibility for the work in South America, organizing numerous stakes and opening missions for the first time in Ecuador and Colombia. After three years of supervising the work in South America, he was given responsibility for the work in Europe, then was reassigned supervision of Asia for an additional three years. Wherever he went, he carried a tangible love for the people and a faith that left them strengthened. On May 22, 1963, Elder Hinckley dedicated a new meeting house on the island of Huahini in French Polynesia. As a boat of members and friends returned to the home island of Mao Piti, a mid-Pacific storm arose, capsizing the vessel and crashing it into a reef. Fifteen passengers lost their lives, including ten women, five of whom were mothers, three small babies, and a five-year-old girl. All but two of the Relief Society's sisters of the Mao Piti branch were gone. Elder Hinckley canceled his flight back to Salt Lake City and on an old PT boat sped toward Mao Piti. As Elder Hinckley stepped off the dock, he took the grieving families in his arms and wept with them. He held the children who were left motherless and spoke words of comfort. A service was held in the chapel which was attended by hundreds, both members and non-members on the island. Elder Hinckley was deeply affected by the events of Mao Piti. That evening he wrote in his journal, This has been a terrible day. I'm glad I came. I shall never forget Mao Piti. In September 1972, the newly ordained president of the church, Harold B. Lee, asked Elder Hinckley to accompany him on a historic trip to Europe and the Middle East. It would be the first visit by a president of the church to the Holy Land in 2,000 years. We visited the garden tomb and President Lee was very quiet and then he expressed the view that this was the place where the body of the crucified Lord was laid and that it was here that the first glorious Easter morning occurred when the stone was rolled away. It was a wonderful experience to hear the president of the church, the prophet of the Lord, speak those words with the certitude with which he expressed himself. In May 1980, Elder and Sister Hinckley accompanied the BYU young ambassadors on an historic trip to China, where one billion people, nearly one-fourth of the Earth's population, resides. Here they found crowds of friendly and intelligent people, eager to learn. Each of us recognized, he wrote, that somehow under the power of the Almighty, this land will eventually be open to the teaching of the restored gospel. A year later, he accompanied the young ambassadors on an extensive performing tour of Yugoslavia, Romania, and Russia. As the world and the church moved into the 1980s, it appeared there were few places Gordon B. Hinckley had not been, and few things he had not done. But on July 23, 1981, a new level of responsibility came upon him. Now a new assignment has come. I appreciate the confidence of President Kimball of Presidents Tanner and Romney, as well as that of my brethren of the Twelve, the Seventy, and the Bishopric. My only desire is to serve with loyalty wherever I am called. 
Whether this assignment be lengthy or brief, I pledge my best effort given with love and faith. His would be the steady and reassuring voice in the first presidency that members worldwide would grow to appreciate and love. Shortly after his call into the first presidency, President Kimball's health began to deteriorate. Then N. Eldon Tanner passed away, and the health of President Romney failed. By the end of January 1983, the day-to-day -day responsibility of the office of the first presidency had largely fallen upon him. It was a very heavy and overwhelming responsibility. It was a, an almost terrifying load at times. We consulted with our brethren of the Twelve constantly and frequently, but with all of that, there were times when I felt overwhelmed, and I recall on one particular occasion getting on my knees before the Lord and asking for help in the midst of a very difficult situation and there came into my mind those reassuring words be still and know that I am God I knew then that this was his work that he would not let it fail that all we had to do was work at it and do our very best and that the work could move forward without let or hindrance of any kind The decade of the 80s saw a substantial increase in the construction of new temples throughout the world. During a three-year period alone from 1983 to 1986, President Hinckley dedicated 18 temples around the world in locations from South Africa to Chicago. It's interesting to note that of the 47 temples that uh, we have in operation in the church, President Hinckley has been involved in the dedication or rededication of all but five of those temples. I returned only yesterday from Santiago, Chile, after flying all night. We there dedicated a new building. It was a marvelous experience. Preceding that were similar experiences in Atlanta, Samoa, Tonga, and other parts of the world. I think I've spoken to 15 different congregations in the last 10 days, scattered from California to Santiago, Chile, to Detroit, Michigan. Just ahead is the general conference for which much of preparation is needed. I do not have a speechwriter. I have only the opportunity to pray and work. When I've concluded today, you may conclude that I should have prayed more <laughs> and written less. In 1985, he was called as first counselor to President Ezra Taft Benson, and in 1994, first counselor to President Howard W. Hunter. On June 12, 1994, President Hinckley returned to his beloved Preston, where he had labored as a missionary 61 years earlier. There, as a member of the First Presidency, he presided over the groundbreaking ceremony for a Temple of the Lord. This is an emotional experience for me. Never back in those years would I have dreamed that here in Lancashire, there would someday stand a house of the Lord and that I would have a part in breaking ground for his construction. When he learned that one of his dear friends of years ago when he was a young man as a missionary was in the audience, he came off of the stand and worked his way through the audience with, the, with emotion seeking to find Robert Pickles. When he found him sitting in a wheelchair, he took hold of his hand, they embraced one another, tears streamed down both of their cheeks, and it was a great reunion. That is so typical of President Gordon B. Hinckley, his great love for the saints.
Our purpose in inviting you here this morning is to announce that a new president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Gordon Bittner Hinckley, was ordained and set apart in the Salt Lake Temple yesterday, Sunday, March 12th, 1995. President Hinckley becomes the 15th president of the church. I have appreciated his great spiritual depth, his knowledge of the scriptures, his knowledge of the revelation, his knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which he has always emphasized in his ministry. President Hinckley has been prepared in a marvelous way. He has been schooled, and he has been carefully honed, we might say, for this wonderful, marvelous call that has come to him to be God's prophet here upon the earth. I don't know of any single man who's come to the presidency of this church who has been so well prepared. He's been taught by all of the great leaders of our time one-on-one. -on -one. I'm sure that no man in the history of the church has traveled so far to so many places in the world with a single purpose in mind, that is to preach the gospel, to bless and lift up the saints, and to foster the redemption of the dead. Brother Hinckley has a compassionate heart, and he's quick to forgive, and he's ready to welcome home any traveler who has perhaps strayed from the path of full activity and now has those quickenings in his heart, that yearning for home. And President Hinckley will say welcome home with outstretched arms. I know that God, our eternal Father, lives and that he stands at the head of this work. I know that Jesus is the Christ, the Redeemer and the Savior of the world and that he is the living head of this church whose name it bears. I know that the conversation which took place between the father and the son and the boy Joseph was as intimate and as real as is my conversation with you. That the Book of Mormon is true, that the priesthood is upon the earth, that this is the work of, all, of the Almighty, and that it's great challenge and destiny lies ahead of it and that it will continue to move forth until it has accomplished the mission for which the Almighty has outlined for it. I'm grateful for that testimony. I love the work. I love the faithful people of this church and I leave my blessing with them. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen.